Hello everyone and welcome to the newest episode of the Read Right to Left podcast. I am G from Simply G, joined by my always wonderful co-host Ray from Whimsical Pictures. Hello everybody. <laughs> and this month it's it's February. It's Valentine's. Love is in the air. And so we decided that we were going to be spotlighting a very specific romance writer, a mangaka, Kaoru Mori, who is a... I'm a big fan of. I, I love her work. Yeah, I'm a fan as well. Uh, I don't think anyone can be as big of a fan as she is, but <laughs> <laughs> I am quite a big fan of her work as well. Yeah. And so we'll be talking about her various titles, her two probably most notable series, but I think we'll we'll chat a little bit about her other works too, because we do have almost all of her her manga available in English, which is amazing and great for me as and you as fans, right? Like can't complain. Yeah. As a uh, would have been I think unthinkable uh a few years yes. ago, but yeah. <laughs> Very much so. So for those who aren't familiar, Kaoru Mori is a seinen mangaka who writes typically historical romance series. Uh, her two most popular titles are Emma, uh, which got an anime adaptation called Emma, A Victorian Romance, which is set during the Victorian period. It's a uh, a, a romance between a, like, separation of class. We have a, a maid, and Maury loves her maids. <laughs> very, very into them. And the young <laughs> master of a, like, a upper house, um, much, much higher in standing. So they're kind of romance that, that the society is against, uh, which is very sweet to the point it's completed in 10 volumes and was initially released by CMX in English got a re-release in English by Yen Press in 5 2-in-1 omnibus uh, editions the actual main story of William and Emma ends in the 7th volume and then the last 3 volumes are kind of short story uh, additional um, yeah, just little bits and pieces from within that world, within the setting, a lot of the side characters. It's very good. And her other title, which I think most people would be familiar with, is A Bride Story, which is an ongoing series. I believe there's 13 volumes in Japanese currently, 12 in English, and is another historical romance set in the Middle East. So the Silk Road kind of period between a 20-year-old woman uh, called Amir and her 12-year-old husband, Karluk, which is a very big age gap, um, both in modern day and uh, <laughs> then as well, but not in the historical uh, context is that Amir is far too old to, to be getting into her first marriage, um, and she's mm -hmm. kind of a bit, she's missed the boat a little bit at 20, but it's focused not only on those two and their relationship, their marriage, their family, the culture, um, and all of those things surrounding that, but also various other marriages and relationships within different communities across the Middle East. It's very, very good, really um, insightful for a particular period of history that I don't think a lot of, especially Westerners, are that familiar with. And like with yeah. Emma, there's a huge... Uh, Maureen puts in a lot of effort to be very accurate to a time period. She's very detail-focused, uh, both in her artwork and in getting the facts right. I just want to clarify that uh, parts of it do take place in the Middle East. Uh, there's some uh, one couple in particular that takes place in Persia. Mm -hmm. uh, but this also takes place across uh, further along the mm -hmm. Silk Road um, in Central Asia. So... There are couples from quite a wide span of area. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
just yes. energetic. No, no, so. that's absolutely correct. Um, and with a brave story, not only do we get a whole range of different cultural marriages and couples from different backgrounds and um, more specifically how marriage and how uh, households and cultures treat treat relationships but we also see a wide variety of of relationships obviously our main character or main couple has this larger age gap but we also have a more traditional uh, aged couple um, or couples I should say uh, at about 12 14 years old getting ready to to get married we have a queer relationship mm -hmm. uh, to women who are are actually both wives to one person um, but are also kind of sworn sisters which is a really interesting um, dynamic that I don't think a lot of people are aware of as well as a, a, a mixed race uh, how is the how, like all, different cultural yeah. backgrounds we have a westerner and um, a, a woman from this area he's kind of a uh, what is it? anthropologist traveling throughout the Silk Road and who obviously fell in love uh, during his travels. So you get a lot of different dynamics, a lot of different age ranges, a lot of different issues and um, contexts that these characters are are in. So it's, yeah, you, get, you certainly get a lot for your experience with a bride story. All sorts of, all sorts of romantic couples. And then out of the other Mori titles that we have in English, there is a short story collection called Kaoru Mori's Anything and Something, which is as is pretty much <laughs> uh, self-explanatory, just a collection of short stories, stuff that was published in magazines just by themselves. Um, you can really see her focus and interest in certain things, uniforms, maids, etc. Beautiful. There's Women. a lot of that throughout <laughs> of her, all of her manga. And then the other... Which... <laughs> Look, my girl knows what she exactly. likes. Exactly. <laughs> and she's very good. <laughs> she's very good at depicting that. Um, but her other title, which is really the only incomplete title of hers that we have in English, is Shirley, which the first volume was released by CMX. Uh, but by the time it was continued... Uh, CMX had actually gone bankrupt. There was no, like, they didn't exist anymore. So, uh, before we jump into kind of specifics of these series or any of our questions, did you want to talk a little bit about um, your experience reading her works, Ray? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I think most of how my experience started was just, um, they happened to have the old CMX volumes of Emma at my library when I was mm -hmm. in high school. Um, so that was, that was what I read. Um, I rem I distinctly remember that there were some volumes that were a real pain to get a hold of. I guess someone was neglecting to turn in their library mm -hmm. books. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I read all 10 there across sort of a long period of time. And, um, I really enjoyed them, I think, more than I thought mm -hmm. I would. Especially, like, the latter half when we get into some of the other mm -hmm. couples. Because I think that, uh, my experience is similar to a lot of people where, like, uh, Emma and William are not the most interesting relationship in mm -hmm. that series for me. Um, and then with A Bride Story, uh... I think I might have read the first volume from the library. Either that or I was excited for that one to begin with and started buying it as soon as it came out. I can't quite remember. But um, that one was just like, I loved that one from mm -hmm. the start. It was um, everything I loved about Emma just like was even more polished and even more confident. And uh, I just really enjoyed all of the characters um I went in not knowing what to expect with that mm -hmm. age difference 
uh, because, you know, usually you hear an age difference like that, and uh, in our particular beloved medium of manga, it is not usually a good <laughs> a good sign. <laughs> um, not handled the most mm-hmm. tastefully. That There's, like, never any, like, discomfort at all with this series. It's, like, the sweetest thing. Yep. <laughs> and I... I have continued reading a bride story and i haven't uh been reading the ones that have come out since i came to japan so i'm Mm. kind of behind but yep (laughs) i also uh my library had anything and something so i read that at some point as well it's like it's not that exciting of uh of a tale (laughs) i guess i just it's an author that I've, i've i've read her work for a long time uh what about what about you, G? So I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, that I was first introduced to Mori's work via the Emma anime, um, because most, as mm-hmm. most people know, and as you know, Ray, that I was an anime fan first. Like, <laughs> it took me a little while to get into mm-hmm. manga, um, but I, I really enjoyed that. I thought it was very well done. It was. This is when. The anime was really only available. I think I watched it on Nozomi's YouTube channel, legally streaming, um, mm-hmm. and just fell in love with it. I grew up with a mother who watches like Pride and Prejudice once a month, so <laughs> like, which is a difference. <laughs> like, it's not a different setting. It's still England, but like that whole kind of, you know idea of romance within historical England is very much ingrained in a lot of my upbringing. I did like Emma and William. They, I will agree they're not the most interesting of couples. Those would be the Germans. Yes. Um, but yes, <laughs> but yes. I did enjoy yeah. it a lot <laughs> and I decided that I wanted to... Once I did get into manga, I then wanted to seek out Maury's work. At that point, I believe only A Bride Story was available from Yen Press. Maybe anything and something. So I I bought and read and fell in love with A Bride Story. Similarly to you, just absolutely head over heels from the first page. Uh, just fantastic mm-hmm. series. And I just continued to follow and collect and enjoy her works once Yen rescued Emma again it was not really even a question of whether or not I would be picking that up and following it and reading it for the first time the anime is a little bit different from the manga as well so it was a a yet again another experience of that um and Mm -hmm. yeah it's just like with a lot of the mangaka that I enjoy and seek out multiple works from, it it made sense that I would attach myself so much to her. And I have never really been disappointed mm-hmm. with her work. Um, even if the characters, like, for example, in Emma, aren't necessarily the most captivating or thrilling of protagonists I do still think that there's such a beautiful way that she writes relationships and intimacy and quiet moments between people and and the development Mm -hmm. of a connection that is so hard to find in manga especially romance manga um, without Mm -hmm. (laughs) normal like normally a lot of that emotional impact can be very overwrought or very over the mm-hmm. top and Mori is able to convey so much without a single word. I think that expressiveness um, is just mm. amazing right? So that yeah. was one of the the really important things that um, really attracted to me to her work from the very beginning and continues to, she just is a master at, <laughs> like there's so many beautiful quiet moments you'll have like whole chapters in a bride story that where no one says anything um, Mm -hmm. but it's so easy to follow Um, but it's it also is so easy as to what's being said like what exactly what emotion is being conveyed or mood or atmosphere 
it's just mm. phenomenal. I don't know how she does it. <laughs> She's very talented. <laughs> yeah. So should uh, we just go ahead and start getting into questions? Use those as a framework for our Absolutely. discussion. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> Uh, first set of questions is from at Rin Reads Manga. Uh, Rin asks us first, what aspects of Kaori Mori's work stand out from other works in your opinion? Uh, they specifically ask in terms of romance as well. So G already talked a little bit about like those quiet moments, uh, which I definitely agree with. I think like, you know, even if, certain details have like slipped my mind over the years it's like there will always be like some little just wonderful intimate moments that just feel so real like you can almost feel mm -hmm. like the warmth of the two characters yeah it's very intimate i don't know that's the best word for it i think intimate mm -hmm. not in terms of like sexual necessarily but just in terms of like the closeness of two human beings um, she's very mm -hmm. good at conveying that. Also, just the incredible amount of research that goes into her settings and her artwork. Anyone will tell you this about Kaori Mori, but it's just... I think, specifically, it's, like, the fact that she does all this research and it doesn't end up coming out in the form of, like, an illustrated textbook. <laughs> she very much uses her fascination with these places and these people in order to craft just a very, very immersive world. These are very lived in, very intricate, very real settings. Like you feel like you're living in that time, in that place with these people. And mm -hmm. that I think is the most infectious thing about her work to me consistently that keeps me coming back. I just love escaping to a time and a place very far away full of kind mm -hmm. people you know very much so i think in addition to that quiet intimacy that we see throughout all of her works there's also a real her her characters and the, the especially the romantic relationships but all of the relationships really um, there's this level of respect between the two characters mm. that isn't always inherently true for manga couples, right? <laughs> um, and I think that's a big part as to why a bride story works so well, especially considering the large age gap between our main couple yeah is that there's never like this power imbalance. There's never this lack of respect between mm -hmm. these characters. So you can feel and understand why they care about each other and why we want to be supportive of their relationship. And yeah, all of them have, like all of these characters have pretty varied personalities and you know goals and things that they they are enjoy and want to do but they all feel like very real people and when we're talking about the romance aspect their partners or or the other half of this couple normally is or is typically someone who does isn't identical but is supportive and understanding and is willing to be there for you know their their counterpart it's really mm -hmm. lovely <laughs> really sweet <laughs> especially when some romance across the board you know in all media there is such a tendency for strife and like misunderstandings and drama mm -hmm. for the sake of drama uh, these characters feel more like people who communicate and therefore have a healthier relationship with each other. <laughs> We're not going to have to worry about, you know, halfway through the series, a rival coming in and then our couple's not talking to each other for five books. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, like, what it comes down to is, like, her characters, even when they aren't, like, technically adults, um, mm -hmm. they feel very adult. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. The way that they, they treat each other, it 
you know, they, they talk to each other like adults. So, well, the adults do. And the kids, I think, are, like, age-appropriately sort of precocious. Mm -hmm. Um, Karluk doesn't really fit into that because he, culturally speaking, is an adult. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) so his whole arc is he very much, you know, has been forced into the position of being the, the man in within his larger family and community context and Mm -hmm. he's very proud of that and wants to do a good job but like he struggles Mm -hmm. because he's still only 12 and like his you know his wife is so much older than him and sometimes looks at him more as a mother looking at a son so he's got a very compelling arc but he definitely is uh certainly more mature than 12 year olds are like in Mm -hmm. our society but I think he is in a way that's realistic (laughs) yeah I think when you look at it culturally as we've mentioned multiple times at this point it's it wasn't unusual for people to be getting married at 12 14 years old historically again across cultures um so the fact that Carlock is 12 like he's a little bit on the lower age range for to be married but not really he's kind of at the perfect stage or at the point of his life where this is a pretty typical change a, a pretty typical role that young men are, mm-hmm. are stepping into but in the modern context the, he's a child right 12 year old <laughs> years old shouldn't i don't think should be getting married typically but again <laughs> this is a whole different historical and cultural context so when you take yeah. that into account and then you also regard as you said this he has this wife who he adores as well just by the way he completely is smitten with Amir he thinks she's fantastic he has no issue with her being older outside of him feeling like he needs to then step up to be the man that she deserves right so Mm -hmm. that whole evolution of his storyline of him trying to be again the best partner for his his wife is an emotional maturity that is beyond or different from what a modern context might look at somebody his age would have yeah um so uh all that was just to say that yeah, the the couples in this, in Kaoru Mori's work, really communicate with each other like adults do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to say that that's also true in terms of like physical intimacy as well. Uh, that's mm-hmm. not something that we really get into with that particularly couple. <laughs> but um, like I particularly think of the Germans, which I think we'll get more into later, um, mm-hmm. because I like them very much. But, um, uh, that couple is very, they're very sexual. They're very sexually intimate. They like, they like having some fun. (laughs) Even with that, it's like, it's a very mature form of intimacy. It's very, Mm -hmm. like, tasteful and very, like, these are two adults who love each other very much and are enjoying each other and enjoying their love for each other. And it's just such a delight to read. I don't know, because mm-hmm. they just adore each other so much. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought the Germans up because that when we talk about that quiet intimacy and that oh, sexual charge as well, there's a beautiful... And I always remember a, a beautiful sequence from Emma, wherein they're in bed. It's the morning, you know, they're getting ready uh, before getting out of bed for breakfast or whatever else. And it's, it's mm-hmm. a, again, a wordless scene wherein the wife of, of the two, she's just playing with her husband's fingers, right? And there's just mm-hmm. that, that quiet touch and that familiarity. And then we, that, then transitions into them 
or her remembering their first, like when they were first dating and when they were first courting, um, and this lifetime they've had together and all of this happiness that they brought each other. And it's just so Mm -hmm. beautiful. And that's, again, conveyed entirely without a single word. It's completely Mm -hmm. expressions and you can really tell how important these people are to each other. You, we don't need a monologue of like all of the amazing things that you know this woman thinks about her husband. It's evident. It's it's reflected yeah. in how sweet and passionate and full of love their their private moments are together, as well as their public moments. It's just amazingly done (laughs) oh i also wanted to say um uh we're talking about like the adult aspects of her work but i did bring up the kids earlier and Mm -hmm. i want to say that i absolutely love kaoru mori's kids they're so cute (laughs) (laughs) they're so plush and adorable you just want to pinch their cheeks cute they're so oh my goodness the girl in a bride story who's like the only thing she's really good at embroidery but she can only embroider birds because she's just uh-huh. as obsessed <laughs> with birds uh, i just uh they're so cute <laughs> they're so so cute um and it's just like you know they aren't like chatting away and being annoying it's like the mm-hmm. little things you know the way that you know some kid will just like crawl into some little crevice that only they can fit into and just with (laughs) wide-eyed wonder like look at a pattern in the wall or something Mm -hmm. or like find their mom's makeup or something and it's just like such a wonderful representation of what makes children charming (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know but I think a lot of creators like fail to capture because they're too focused on maybe what the kids should be saying rather yeah. than just the way that kids are. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think that's a great point and I we've talked about it before uh, on the podcast and I'm sure I've talked about it, it in videos before and I've talked to you privately about it before that I'm a little bit of a cynic whenever there's a series that features a cute kid uh, <laughs> because Half the time, it just feels like an agenda for nerds to have children. (laughs) (laughs) Like Shinzo Abe. The ghost image of Shinzo Abe appearing in the sky. Have sex. Exactly. (laughs) It's like, all you you nerds have sex. We have have an aging population. Please have children. Look how cute they are. (laughs) So I am highly critical of a lot of very popular series that do feature cute kids. And I do, like, I like cute kids. I love real-life kids. I think they're adorable. Um, (laughs) So that's not my issue. But I do think that there's something so perfectly how you you said, right, of how these these kids within Maury's works, whether it is Emma or A Bride Story or, uh, you know, a myriad of her stuff, they... They feel like, one, actual kids, right? (laughs) Like, they Mm -hmm. act like kids without being aggressively annoying, having to steal the entire (laughs) scene so everything is focused on them. Um, Yeah. And also, especially in a bride story, when we're talking about, like, these these cultures that is so focused on family and the the Mm -hmm. communal family and you know, whole generations living together in a, in a mm-hmm. single house, how important the next generation or the younger generations are and every family member's role within raising children. And it's just so... It's so good. It's just so good. I don't know how to express this, but, like, the kids and Emma as well, it's like, I feel like when you mentioned, like, kids, like, jumping out and, like, stealing a scene from all the other characters. <laughs> um, I feel like that's part of what Maury gets 
when mm-hmm. she's portraying kids is like that kids typically like there are kids who like just want to be the center of attention at all times but for the most mm-hmm. part kids do not want to be involved in the adults conversations <laughs> <laughs> like that is the last thing they want to do they're gonna go mm-hmm. off they're gonna be super shy around the adults and then they're gonna run off and go do whatever bullshit kids do off on their own uh-huh. and i feel like that's typically where maury does like her kid scenes, especially in Emma, because as you said, in a bride story, there's much more of this, like, larger community, this emphasis on, like, you know, teaching certain crafts to the younger generations. Um, or, you know, some kids taking care of the, the kids even younger than them. But mm-hmm. um, in Emma in particular, it's usually just, like, these little kids, like, not really getting what the adults are talking about, so they kind of just run off on their own and do whatever. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and she'll just occasionally like you know jump away from what the adults are doing to like check in on what the kids are doing and you know mm-hmm. it's just very very sweet <laughs> <laughs> um yeah perfect example is um william's youngest brother colin yes that's who i was who's just like <laughs> So the sweetest cute. little kid, but he's so quiet. He, like, doesn't have any idea what's going on, like, why his dad is so angry at his brother, while his siblings yeah. are kind of, like, not not too sure how to react to things. And he's just got his... He's just trying to live his life as a sweet little, like, <laughs> eight-year-old. And I'm just like, oh, kid, you, he's so you cute. really try. Also, is it him or is it the... German little boy who has the squirrel because one of them oh, has a pet remember. squirrel and there's a whole chapter about this squirrel like going on an adventure and this kid <laughs> trying to like recapture it. This is it's really sweet. This is the kind and of again, bravery the kind of <laughs> bravery that we have not seen from Miss Mizuho Kusanagi. Okay. <laughs> the bravery to give the squirrel his own little <laughs> adventure. You are extremely we, we correct, have been, my friend. We have been asking Miss Kusanagi <laughs> to step up to the plate um, to, to really bring that energy, um, and she simply <laughs> has not, and I think that this is uh, a, a great uh, grievance against myself in particular, Mm. Mm. Um, <laughs> and she should look to Miss Kaurumori for guidance uh, in this matter. <laughs> <laughs> also, another thing, nothing to do with like the human relationships or the romance or anything, but man oh man, Mori is good at drawing animals. She's so mm-hmm. good at drawing animals. All sorts of animals. Yeah. Birds, small, you know, squirrels and things, horses. And especially she... horses. She <laughs> especially loves horses. Especially horses. Loves horses. She is a horse girl, and she owns that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, again, like, such a a important aspect in, culturally in a bride story. Amir comes from yeah. a nomadic tribe. Uh, that have sheep and horses and are constantly traveling throughout the year. Similarly, Carluk's family and, and the community is at large typically have a couple animals that they raise, whether that's chickens, mm-hmm. sheep, goats, um, and, and hawks or falconry, right? So mm-hmm. these animals are a very important part of the family and and the relationship with how they hunt or how they, you know, do make their living, right? Whether it's being shepherds yeah. or facilitating, uh, yeah, uh, falconry, hunting, that sort of thing. It's just so well done. And there's nothing worse than, well, not nothing worse, but there's a lot of artists who are fantastic, but they really struggle with animals, right? Like, mm. Animals yeah. can be hard to, to get right, and we can always tell, unless it's a super stylized, cartoony, you know, particular style, 
if it's not yeah. done correctly, you do notice it. Yeah. Her horse drawings are just stunning. Mm -hmm. They're so full of life. There's entire chapters in A Bride Story that's just the horseback riders who are um, Amir's uh, brothers. Mm -hmm. And it's just where there's no, again, no words at all. It's just just enjoying the beauty of these animals, really. Mm -hmm. um, no other point to the chapter. They're just traveling or just hunting. It's just Kaurumori really wanted to draw some horses. And she drew the fuck out of some horses. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. This one we got a couple different times uh, from different people. Mm -hmm. But uh, what couple is your favorite out of all of her works? Um, so we actually did get from at Marumichi a uh, favorite couple of romance from Emma and Y and favorite couple and romance from Bride Story and Y. So... How about we talk about our favorite from each and then which is our favorite overall? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we both mentioned that the Germans are the best from Emma. Yes. But hands down, the they are. There's <laughs> a the lot best. of different... <laughs> there are a lot of different yeah. couples in Emma. Obviously, Emma and William. Um, the, there's the her foster mother or like her... The woman she worked for and her husband yeah. prior to his death. I think they were sweet. Mm. There's a lot of... And, and William's parents as well. They have kind of a rocky relationship, but you can see how much that they care about each other. They've just been separated mm -hmm. because of society. Um, there's a lot of really well done romantic writing there, but hands down, the Germans... They're so good. They're so They're good, so and good. I want more from them. <laughs> yeah, I just... I just want to exist in their marriage. They're, they're so... Just wildly in love. And so funny. They're just funny characters. <laughs> <laughs> Talk yeah, about relationship they're, they're... goals. <laughs> yeah. To be honest... And the lady <laughs> is so pretty. <laughs> and she we get is... to see her uh, in so many outfits and also no outfit at all. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a scandalous state of undress. And man, oh man, she pulls it <laughs> off. <laughs> you know what? Kaori Mori, she loves her women. She loves her mm. women, whether they're in clothes or out of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ugh, all of her dresses are just mwah, mwah. Mm, gorgeous. Love a good dress. Height of sophistication, height of fashion, yes. and and the Germans as well are such a counterpoint to the like upper English society that has up until that point mm -hmm. been very aggressively against William and Emma's relationship. Um, at that point in the story, Emma has left the area that she was originally in mm -hmm. due to the sad passing of, of the woman she worked for, but also because of just the pressures and her kind of struggling with with wanting to be with William, but then believing that things wouldn't work out. So there was a freedom in how the in what the Germans... Uh, kind of offered her that she wasn't getting in like a more traditional English uh, society yeah. setting um, and it was her the, her you know the Germans that introduced her to um, who we later find out is William's mother <laughs> um, mm -hmm. who is just completely outside of this uh, yeah the, these very strict societal rules uh Oriella mm -hmm. Aurelia something along those lines and then again that opening up and offering her an option that she up until that point had just kind of dismissed so mm -hmm. not only are they just amazing characters and the just like peak romance but they they contribute a lot to the story as well yeah. um they're not just <laughs> they're important 
<laughs> they're 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 very important. They're we wouldn't have important. our 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 end game romance without them. <laughs> but also, I just love them. <laughs> <laughs> I love them and their dresses and their house. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, and then in a bride story, uh, who's your favorite couple in a bride story? That's, it's so hard. Because I adore our main couple, Amir and Karluk. Like, I I really Mm -hmm. do love their relationship. But then I Mm -hmm. also love other relationships. Yeah. To be perfectly (laughs) honest, the only relationship uh, I'm not... Like, I don't dislike them, but because of the characters I'm not, like, super in love with are the twins and their husbands. Yeah. Um, And that's not because any of them are badly written. It's because they're all 14 years old and they act 14 years old. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, it, they're, I do think that they're, they're good characters and I do like, I do think couple-wise, like, they're well-suited because they've known each other for ages and you know honestly if anyone's gonna put up with those girls it's those those two <laughs> boys right like yep. <laughs> they know and what they're going to their entire community feels too <laughs> exactly like, right well um yep that that was gonna happen eventually <laughs> <laughs> But I really love um, Paria's story. I think yeah. her relationship with Umar is just super sweet, just mm-hmm. lovely, right? And and I really like I well to a certain extent I really sympathize and understand <laughs> and empathize with <laughs> like feeling a little bit left out, like you're not you're not suited for romance. No one will want you right like mm-hmm. Pari is Aww. she's 14 15 like a little bit older and she's just mm-hmm. she's not she's been so preoccupied with certain things in her life that she's really far behind on like all of her bridal embroidery and so she doesn't mm-hmm. she doesn't feel like she's suited or that anyone would pick her for a wife because she just is like well there's so many other better options than me and I just it's just so nice to see her grow a little bit more confident and and get some Mm -hmm. reassurance from somebody who really cares about her um it's Mm -hmm. super duper sweet to see I also Mm -hmm. really love Henry and Talos this who is like an older mm-hmm. couple it's this this english guy and and this widow who he meets over the course of his travels and they have such mm-hmm. a beautifully evolved relationship um from their very first mm-hmm. meeting to when they're traveling together and ultimately decide to stay together um it's just mm-hmm. ooh, it's good hits me in the heart <laughs> not to be a stereotype but i like the bisexual ones i i love those two women i actually love Mm. like their like funky little like the way that they're ultimately able to sort of be sworn sisters with each other Mm -hmm. um while also like sharing a husband (laughs) um, sharing a husband because uh i can't remember their names but the main girl is um already married at the start of this story when she mm-hmm. meets this other woman. I just love them a lot. <laughs> um, I love the setting of Persia. I just think it's mm-hmm. so stunningly beautiful. All of the architecture and the gardens. Uh, the way that Kaoru Mori draws hair mm-hmm. in those volumes is just so beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, um, or just cannot get enough. Um, but yeah, just like seeing, I guess I'm always fascinated by those types of like. It's not necessarily defined in the same way as a heterosexual romance, but like mm-hmm. it's more than a typical friendship. Mm-hmm. Um, 
that has like some like romantic and sexual elements but you know is a type of relationship um that doesn't necessarily exist in my own cultural experience Mm -hmm. as a white american i really like seeing that explored whether it's like the class s dynamic that you see in japanese media or like this uh this persian couple it's so cool i don't know to see like the breadth of like human love and emotion and Mm -hmm. different types of relationships and like just how queer women have loved each other and enjoyed each other throughout the Mm -hmm. world is like really cool and yeah i think their dynamics also super sweet because uh the they're just super shy with each other (laughs) (laughs) um i think that uh the difference in body types is quite nice as well they're both very Mm -hmm. beautiful women um but one of them is certainly more on the voluptuous side the other one is more uh kind of kind of stick stick thin (laughs) wayfish yeah uh not too curvy um and like the difference in their body types is also you know nice i don't know Because it's like, there's a lot of, uh, uh, nudity, I would say, both sexual and non in those Mm -hmm. Persian chapters because they do meet in the bathhouse. Um, so there is a lot more nudity in those, those books than there are (laughs) with some of the other couples. Mm. Uh, which, you know, as we've already established, I appreciate that as well. <laughs> uh, Mori, she is just as loving with her hand drawing women as she is drawing horses or <laughs> dresses. So, <laughs> maid uniforms. Yeah, she she knows what she likes to draw and she just gives herself excuses to draw lots of those things. <laughs> Which, more power to her. Honestly, love that. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, I and, and I agree. Anissa and, and Shireen are the two that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, the characters they are wonderful, and I I appreciate that. To your point, there is like it's not really a question of their sexuality because for Anissa, she has she's been married and she loves her husband. Like she adores her husband, mm-hmm. and when she discovers this attraction and this interest in Shireen it's never a question of like well I now I care about her more than I care about my husband it's more I care about both of these people and maybe and I care about them in similar ways and for mm-hmm. that particular relationship um Shireen becomes a an additional a second wife uh to to Anissa's husband because yeah. she is widowed quite young mm-hmm. and so it's not only a way for these two women to be together but a way for uh Anise to offer support or offer you know her mm-hmm. what she can to to Shireen to this woman that she cares about because she's no longer, you know, she no longer has a husband to support her. Um, and with the yeah. young also, child, you know, that's hard. Mm-hmm. I just want to say, um, can we, like, just uh, throw some support towards um, <laughs> this series' number one wife guy? <laughs> 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 um, his wife comes to him like, hey, uh, I'm in love with this woman. You want to, like, marry her too? Uh, she's got a little kid. Uh, I think it would really help her out. And he's like, anything for you, darling. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, are you sure you'll be okay with that? And she's like, please do it for me. And he's like, absolutely. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> we love to see it. We love to see yeah, it's it. <laughs> fantastic. Um... So, I mean, we kind of just said that we enjoy every relationship in A Bride Story, which isn't really (laughs) (laughs) choosing a favorite, but it's hard. It really is hard. 
Um, I did choose yeah. a favorite, though. I chose the gay ones. Yes, <laughs> which is not surprising. <laughs> um, I would say out of all of them, it's a pretty close, for me, um, out of all of them for a bride story, it's a pretty close neck and neck between Paria and Umar and and Karluk and Amir. Like, there's just, there's a lot to love between both of those couples. Um, mm -hmm. But again, every every volume, I just fall more in love with all of these characters and how much they love each other. So you can't <laughs> go too wrong with any of them. <laughs> but who's your favorite overall? Is it the Bride Story ones? Mm, probably. I yeah. I mean, we wax poetic about the Germans for like a solid 20 minutes, so it's not like... <laughs> I dislike them, or that I don't think that they're as strong. There's just less time spent with them, right? Yeah. Compared to some of these other couples that get more of a focus in a bride story. Uh, the Germans are yeah. fantastic, and they're f like they are very prominent characters, but they are not the main characters, and they are not the main couple. They are just mm -hmm. additional additional people who are in love <laughs> within this story yeah so Members you get a ensemble. lot less time with them and which goes back to my point of i wish i wish we saw more of them i want more yeah yeah spin-off series when kaoru mori <laughs> um Last question from Rin is any character you want to see in a relationship next or any particular couple you want to see more from? For a bride story, there what is his name? Ali, the the guy who yeah, like yeah, yeah. travels with Henry. The tour guy, I, I want him to fall in love. <laughs> I don't care with who, but he deserves it. He's a good guy. <laughs> I want him to fall in love with um Amir's hottest brother. <laughs> and I want them oh, to ride Azel? into the sunset on a horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Honestly, there, I, did it. I wrote, I wrote the next couple, <laughs> and they truly are fantastic. That would be a great addition, you know. No arguments from me. But yeah, I like Ali. I think he's a really interesting character. He's a he travels around and is kind of an interpreter. He he, you know, gets um, traveling animals so they can go cr cross country and he has different connections in different cities. So he's a very learned and um, experienced individual. And and part of the mm -hmm. part of his story is that, like, he's gotten to an age where it's like, oh, why aren't you married? Like, oh, and he's like, well, because I travel around so much and, you know. It, who wants to who mm -hmm. wants to settle down with a guy who doesn't settle down, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it would be really interesting to see if something develops there. Um, but also, you know, there might be he might just prefer his more nomadic life without the need for a personal tie to to you know a, a partner. Who knows? I you know care. who else. You know who else lives a nomadic lifestyle <laughs> <laughs> with horses and sheep and and all sorts of things. Amir's hot brother. <laughs> <laughs> He's also the the group's like chief. Uh, so you know he's got power I don't there. Care. So yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> He's got so many horses. <laughs> he has the largest dowry out of everyone. <laughs> Be a great bride. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a good choice. I, I, mm. I think it's a very natural choice as well. He's been fairly prominent and often bemoans his uh, lack of a relationship. <laughs> Next question is from Tay at Tay Yay Yay, probably. 
MV, if you could wish a Mori manga into existence with the same love and attention she gives her own interests, which historical place slash time period would you like her to cover? I'd like her to set something in Japan. Mm. That'd be cool. I know it's like, a, there's a lot of historical manga that are set in Japan, Ray, but um, <laughs> I don't care. I want the Kaori Mori version. Um, mm-hmm. I want it set in like... The Heian era would be so beautiful. Like, imagine the hair. Mm. Oh, gosh. That would be so good. The gardens. Mm. Or, like, maybe the Kamakura Shogunate would be really cool. Mm-hmm. Japan would be cool. <laughs> One of the things that I would love to see is... Um, Indian? Like, uh, India, mm. set in India? Because part of Emma... Like, we have an Indian character, or we have a couple Indian characters, actually, because of, obviously, the, yeah. the British occupation of India. And whether it's yes. during the British occupation or prior to that, India, obviously, is, like, a huge country. There's so many different cultural um, groups there. And it's such a rich mm-hmm. culture that is tied to so many aspects of of their lives. I I would adore seeing something about India. Um I think there's a lot of potential there. I would also like anywhere in Southeast Asia, whether that be Vietnam or the Philippines or Indonesia. Mm-hmm. I think there's so many amazing culturally rich periods of history, but just these countries that maybe get forgotten about or just not even thought of when we talk about like historical settings outside of media from these countries and as someone who loves southeast asia (laughs) i'm a bit biased (laughs) right um but you know there's I'm very appreciative that there's a lot... Like, I I, I do like the fact that she has a Victorian-era romance, and then she has this Silk Road-era romance. I think there's a huge amount of history and, again, culture within all of Southeast Asia that has potential to be explored, and there's so many beautiful... uh, Whether it's fashion, whether it's cultural practices, food, whatever... Um, the family unit mm-hmm. and romance and and um, courtship that could be could be uh, done, mm-hmm. but um, you know it's just very dependent. And so yeah. I would love Maury lovingly rendering uh, <laughs> a story yeah. set. A little bit outside Uh, of the norm. Yeah, I also think, like, I wouldn't normally trust, like, any Japanese creator to tackle, like, anywhere in Africa. Mm -hmm. But I think that if I was going to trust a Japanese creator, I would trust (laughs) Kaoru Mori to do the best job. Uh Um, And there are so many just, like, extremely beautiful, exquisite, like, time periods... Mm -hmm. and like places and kingdoms and it's just the artwork yeah Mm -hmm. honestly sky's the limit like if she did like Benin or something Mm -hmm. that'd be so or Morocco it'd be good it'd be really good (laughs) I mean the amazing thing I'm a big history nerd just generally anyway and I find history fascinating um, especially outside of like Western focused history, <laughs> there's mm-hmm. so much, yeah. Um, you know, just world knowledge and events and things that have completely shaped our global community that so many people aren't aware of, um, which is kind of mm-hmm. sad but not surprising because of how history is typically taught. Like the education isn't fantastic in that regard. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I think especially with manga, there's, that's a great way to get people interested in those time periods as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 
Yeah. So, like, a good example, not that Vikings haven't ever been, like, in the focus of stuff, but I feel like people have learned more about, like, the actual realities of Viking life and that, that period of European history through Vinland Saga versus, like, all mm-hmm. of the normal, Vin- like, Viking media. I don't know. Maybe I'm yeah. misinterpreting things, but I think mm-hmm. having a comic beautifully express a culture, a time period, a important event throughout history is such a fantastic way to build interest um, from an audience who may mm. otherwise have no interest. So, yeah, I will always encourage more historical manga. <laughs> And especially from mm-hmm. Kaoru Mori. Uh, next, we get into questions from Ad Marumichi. We already answered the favorite couple questions. Uh, what things do you particularly like about the way Mori depicts romance and intimacy? We kind of already answered this one in detail. Next one is, uh, what kind of romance story would you like to see from Mori next? So we talked about where we would like uh, our fantasy Mori series to be set where in the world but Mm. what kind of romance story would we like to see I think it's already been incredibly clear what type of story (laughs) I would like to see um and it's a gay one (laughs) that's all and any kind honestly although I do love lesbians writing lesbians so I (laughs) would love to see more lesbians Mm. um Perhaps a series that consists entirely of lesbians. Um, <laughs> sky's the limit, really. <laughs> Lesbian pirates. That'd be great. That would be really <laughs> great. I would absolutely fund that if I had the money. It would. I think so many people would buy Lesbian pirates. <laughs> yes. To be that's honest, the, that's the risk you take, um, and I think it's a it's a pretty pretty all right one. To, to Ray's point, queer stories are always fantastic. I think there's, especially if we're talking historical setting, because there's certain cultures yes. view or have had their attitudes towards queer relationships are very different from uh, <laughs> modern Western uh, mm-hmm. hyper-religious yeah. <laughs> um, takes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's not immediately going to assume to be, like, doom and gloom and homophobia, right? Um, mm-hmm. so, that would be wonderful. I don't also, like, and this might be because I've been reading, uh, another series recently, but I'd also be really interested in a story that depicts disability, whether that be a physical mm. or like a more hidden disability. I don't know if that would work, but I think that again there's a lot of ways that one first of all, disabled people deserve love and romance and I like when they mm-hmm. get the spotlight in that regard. They are just as valid as any other romantic protagonist, but I think if we're talking about a historical context as well, People somewhat think that historically people didn't care about disabled people. It's like, but family members absolutely did look after their disabled relatives. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, there was prosthetics, there was things put into place to help, um, especially physically disabled people. But, you know, whether it's blindness or deafness or whatever, um, there's a lot, there's a lot I think that could be captured with that. And, um, I think there's potential there. I would, I would read it. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, I think that that would be so good. (laughs) (laughs) I would love to read that also. (laughs) Yeah, I, I just, I feel like there's not enough stories about, like, um, disabled characters and disabled protagonists, and certainly mm-hmm. not enough, like, romance that doesn't end in, like, horrific tragedy, mm-hmm. because, like, able-bodied people just can't fathom the idea of, like, disabled people in love and happy. 
Uh (laughs) Um, so, yeah, no, completely agree. And then, last question from Marumichi as a continuation of question four. Uh, the first part of this we already answered, um, would you like Mori to continue with historical romance, and if so, do you have any specific country or time period? We talked about that. Uh, but also, they add, or would you like to see a romance set in modern times? Obviously, like, if Mori wants to write a story that's set in modern times, I would be so game, but Mm -hmm. I do really appreciate her historical settings, Mm -hmm. so... Yeah, I agree. I feel Happy. like um, we get so much modern romance, just it's ubiquitous <laughs> mm-hmm. in all all media. And I like I'm sure if Maury wanted to, she could write a fantastic one, and I would just lap it up like milk, right? Like I would just be all over it. Yeah. But <laughs> but I think when we're talking, I. One of the really strong parts of of Mori's manga is sort of this depiction of how love and relationships hasn't changed, right? Like, hasn't changed throughout history. Yeah. Ultimately, humanity seeks love and seeks companionship and relationships. Um, and those feelings, despite you know, thousands of years and opposite sides of the world and technological advances and whatever else, there it's still just such a human experience to be mm-hmm. or to feel love. Um, and that's yeah. something that's really <laughs> paramount in, in all of her stories. And not just romantic love either, mm-hmm. but um, just... The, the hum- yeah, how inherently human it is just to love one another, <laughs> whether it's family or friends or uh, romantic relationships. Mm-hmm. Since obviously, you know, not everybody um, experiences romantic or sexual attraction, exactly. but, you know, in general. Yes, talking in a general sense, but you're absolutely right. And, um, again, I... <laughs> I wouldn't mind a romance, but I also like a modern romance. But I mm-hmm. feel like a lot of readers live a modern romance or relation. We live <laughs> in current era, right? We are aware yeah. <laughs> of how romance tends to evolve, whether it's through like online dating or again meeting through friends or whatever. We have less of a community structure that that like introduces uh relationships or fosters relationships, which might be an interesting thing to mm-hmm. uh explore. Yeah. But ultimately like <laughs> I want just these these gooey like <laughs> uh love is real stories when I'm sad about my own failures in love. (laughs) Yeah. I think, I do think it would be cool if she wanted to explore, like, you know, a a more modern setting that is not, you know, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Like, Japan. Like, if she wanted to set something in a more modern era within, you know, the same, like, along the Silk Road or, like, you know, somewhere that, like, Southeast Asia, somewhere that's not as, like, written about, mm-hmm. I would be so down for mm-hmm. that. <laughs> uh, but I don't need a Kaoru Mori series that's just, like, set in Saitama or something. Yeah. You know? Especially not... Uh, but I would still read it. Yeah. <laughs> Like, if she wanted to write about a university couple in Tokyo, I wouldn't not read it, and I probably would like it, but I'd feel like there's a lost potential there, (laughs) maybe. Yeah. Um, Because there's a lot of stories that are just that, and it doesn't, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it doesn't take talent or skill or something to write those stories, because that's absolutely not true. But it's pulling a lot more from, like, personal 
experience or um, your own everyday life versus the just hyper um, research that that Maury does this fixation on all of these small details that um, mm -hmm. I feel like you'd miss a lot of her just adoration of of little things of very small important mm -hmm. but um, minor like this intimacy of the everyday which for us was is not the everyday right um, yeah she again this how much she lovingly draws the beautiful embroidery in a, a bride story, which was a very important thing for for these cultures, and also like an important role, a, an important chore that had to be done. It was very, very much ingrained in how these women presented themselves and and created things for their family. And then similarly, the the absolute care. That Maury put into all of the different like housekeeping jobs <laughs> in Emma, like mm -hmm. how yeah. much yes. that was a part of the everyday for hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of people across Eng like, the serving class within England at that point. It's just it's something that for those characters is normalcy. It's mundane. It's important but it's not anything they put too much thought into necessarily but for us it is so different it's it's this point of contact that we don't have within our day-to-day -day lives yeah. but culturally or consciously like, we can understand it really is just like stepping back in time mm -hmm. i think it'd be neat if she made a series about like modern day polynesia <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'd read it. Polynesia is a fascinating part of the world. Beautiful part of the world as well. Beautiful. I'm just thinking of, like, all of the textiles mm -hmm. and, like, clothing, tattoo. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. And just the islands themselves are so beautiful. I'm sorry, I just had, like, a very random thought there. <laughs> Next question is from at 365 days of 801. I've never read any of her works before. Which of her works would you recommend starting with and why? Is there a best reading order? A uh, Bride Story is her most polished work, mm -hmm. I think. Can't go wrong starting with that at all. Yes, I would also, but I would add that Emma is complete out of the two. So if you're wanting like a the full story if you're wanting something that you know has an ending then and if you're maybe more interested in that time period I don't know um, it's dependent but I do agree that as the more polished work as the more uh, fulfilling almost uh, work a bride story is yeah. fantastic it's a great starting starting point and if you enjoy that then continuing with Emma is a is a great option. I don't think everything and something is that easy to find and surely is definitely not easy to find. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh yeah, either that you can't go too wrong, but as a more engaging piece, I would say a bride story. And I do believe that's actually our last question. question. Amazing. We just sped through those. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Incredible. It's a reasonably length podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Say it ain't so. <laughs> but I think that was really a wonderful discussion because I do... I mean, there's a lot to love about Maury's work. And we, we touched on, I think, most of the important things, especially that typically come up in discussion of her titles but also some stuff mm -hmm. that maybe not and I think it's quite evident from people who have read her work what her strengths are um, mm -hmm. it's never really a question of like she's a phenomenal artist which we made mention of but that's not why her series are good 
inherently. It's this meeting of writing, of art, of research, of thoughtfulness of characters, and thoughtfulness of relationship development, and just this this true emotional core that is at the heart of all of her series that speak to this universal human truth of how we relate to each other and it's yeah it's a it's a amalgamation of all of those things because there are fantastic yeah. mangaka who are just amazing at artwork but without the story to back it up then you have a really beautiful series that could be quite vapid or could not hit those emotional beats that they're wanting to. Comparatively, there could be a fantastically written series that has all of these emotional highs and lows and, and genuine connection, but might be failed by an artwork that doesn't support that sort of story. Um, it's hard to get things perfect and I think there's a level of perfection <laughs> in Maury's work mm -hmm. that puts her above and beyond some of her contemporaries so yeah especially in a bride story mm -hmm. um, she's just an incredibly confident creator who knows what she likes mm -hmm. and what she's interested in portraying um, and for me I think that um one of the biggest appeals of her series really is just that perfectly portrayed, just like beautiful mundanity mm -hmm. of her settings and just the way that it really feels like the closest to time travel I think I've ever gotten with any historical fiction. Mm -hmm. It really just feels like you've stepped back in time. It's incredible. And I also, again, to that point, there's no overwrought drama. <laughs> there's no, like, contrived mm -hmm. nope. development of stories to cause friction or to cause, uh, you know, some sort of event. There's n it's not that this is, that her worlds are conflict-free, because there absolutely is conflict within both Emma and A Bride's story, but they come from what was typical of that period. Yeah, it kind of shows that, like, just people aren't... People and systems aren't synonymous. There's mm -hmm. always been people just being people. You know, people care about their families, they care about their loved ones, and they exist within systems. We all live in a society. <laughs> uh, um... <laughs> But that just like we do now, mm -hmm. you know, we don't always, like, go along with the systems that we live in, you know. We don't always agree with them. Mm -hmm. We end up doing whatever's the best for us and the people who are closest to us because that's kind of how humans operate. Mm -hmm. So if whether it's Emma being like, you don't have this, like, well... Here I am personifying the class system. <laughs> I do not approve of this marriage. Mm -hmm. Like, ultimately, it's like, it's William's family um, and the people around them. And it's like, they don't want their son to be miserable. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> We're just kind of trying to vibe the best that we can. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I think that kind of covers all the most important things about Maury and her work. She's an incredibly talented mm -hmm. mangaka, and if you've listened thus far and haven't been inspired to read some of her works, then we've obviously failed, uh, because there's just so much good in her series, and they are definitely worth reading. She is incredibly talented and continues to be putting out some of the best historical manga but also historical romance uh just beyond compare uh yen also puts out beautiful editions of these i don't think we mentioned it but all of both 
Emma and A Bride Story and Everything and Something, the Yen Press Editions are hardcover. They've got beautiful dust jackets. Um, again, gorgeous artwork from Maury all over those. Mm-hmm. Wrap um, around. And yeah. so they're really high quality books as well. Like you definitely get your money's worth gorgeous uh, color pages and things like that inside too. Um, so if you haven't tried her work prior to this, be sure to give it a look. Even if you've up until now been a bit wary, um, maybe understandably of a bride story due to the age gap. It's understandable, but I think once you actually experience it, you understand why people don't have an issue with it. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. Or the more, (laughs) you know, conventional romance in Emma. They're both good. Um, But that's, yeah, thank you everyone who sent in your wonderful questions. Hopefully we answered them to the best of our ability. And um, you enjoyed the answers there. For next month, it is March. um, And we are doing a series spotlight, which is one that's, again, near and dear to both of our hearts, right? (laughs) Mm -hmm. One that I'm very much enjoying or looking forward to uh, returning to. It's complete. It's the yeah, ten same. volume series Mushishi, um, which is was once available in print. Delray. Delray. Thank you. Uh, but is now also <laughs> available digitally from Korancha, and of course the yep. fantastic anime adaptation as well. For those, uh, we will talk about this beautifully quiet somewhat chillingly horrifying slice of life (laughs) supernatural yep quiet little quirky comic um and so as always be sure to send in your questions either in the comment section down below if you're listening to this on youtube otherwise of course you can send the questions directly to me on Twitter when I ask for them. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The... Yes. Yes. (laughs) Uh, As always, the links to both my social media as well as Ray's Twitter and YouTube channel will be in the description. Uh, Be sure to follow Ray because she's great and um, tweets good stuff. I don't tweet good stuff, but you might have to follow me if you're wanting to uh, follow the podcast. Uh, neither of us, <laughs> neither of us tweet good things. Ever. Uh, we we tweet predictable things. So maybe if you're listening, then they're good things to you. Um, <laughs> but as always, you can find this podcast on YouTube on my channel, simply G, or on all of the podcasting platforms, all of the important ones. Uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor FM, um, lots of them. There's so many. Uh, You should probably be able to find it wherever you listen to podcasts. So uh, we do try to make it available and easy to find for everyone. And with that... I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the month. Not too many days left in February. (laughs) Um, And we will see you in the next episode of Read Right to Left. Thanks, everyone. Bye till then. Bye, guys.